Hey there. So, um, I work in a lab inventing stuff, and what we're trying to do is figure out how to take on some of the biggest problems in the world. So, can you see my slides? There we go. So, what we did is we just bought one of every tool in the world, hired one of every kind of scientist, and then started trying to figure out what problems can we solve. And that's kind of a weird business. Um, we invented a new type of nuclear reactor that's powered by nuclear waste, a new antenna technology that can get fast wireless to everyone on the planet. This is a device Bill Gates asked us to work on inventing a way of transporting vaccines and keeping them cold. So this thing will keep vaccines cold for months with no external power. But probably we're most famous for shooting mosquitoes down with laser beams um, as a malaria intervention. So we work on some crazy kinds of inventions. Um, I started working on 3D printers years ago. And I came up with this idea that maybe we could print food using 3D printers, which is crazy. But what's really interesting about a 3D printer is that it's this kind of new technology. And every time you get a new technology, a new chip, a new sensor, a new scientific discovery, it's like a new superpower that you can strap on and go try and solve some problems with. So I fill my brain with problems on one side, I fill my brain with new technologies on the other side, and I try to match them up and ask myself, does this new superpower change anything humans have ever done? Can we do it better, cheaper, faster, more efficiently, in a more humane fashion? And that's what invention is all about, that's what new technology is all about, and that's why I'm excited about it. Well, a 3D printer is a particularly cool kind of superpower, because it's kind of this little programmable factory, and it can make stuff for you just by sending it code. So imagine if you just go to Amazon and click buy now on a pair of sunglasses, and a little 3D printer could print them for you. Or you go click buy now on a pair of shoes and it prints them for you in your size. And maybe prints a little box around them and prints your address on top. And well, The thing about that is it's not how we make things today. The way we make things today is wildly inefficient and far removed from you, right? So we're imagining this factory of the future where nothing would get made until we know exactly who we're making it for. And we know what size to make it and what color, and we make it just in time. Now, I'm trying to invent the technologies we need to get there. And we may never get all the way there, but that's certainly the trajectory that we're on. And so, one of the areas I started looking at is manufacturing for clothes. So the way clothes are made, is almost the same as how we did it 100 years ago. This is yarn spinning operation in America 100 years ago, and yarn spinning in Indonesia today, right? It looks pretty much the same. The sewing looks pretty much the same. Factories full of humans operating fingertips. You guys probably don't need to hear me tell you that the factories are in the cheapest labor regions in the world, right? We moved them out of America, we moved them out of Europe, we first moved them to China, now China's too expensive, so now they're in Bangladesh, right? These factories are pretty dangerous, they're not spending the money they save on safe factories, right? And then what's happening, there's other problems. We're shipping stuff all over the planet. So cotton grows in one country, we ship it across the ocean to China, where it gets bleached and dyed, or, or beaten down and turned into uh, fiber. And then it goes to Indonesia, where we ship, you know, spin yarn and weave fabric. And then it gets shipped to Bangladesh, where it gets sewn into shirts or dresses. And then it gets shipped to America to put on shelves or to Europe. It's a lot of shipping. Beyond that, we don't have any idea who we're making the product for, right? So we make it in small, medium, and large. You are not a lowest common denominator, right? Clothes should be made in your size. 
but we don't have an ability to do that because we make them before we know who they're going on. And then we make too many. So these guys are in Africa wearing Super Bowl winner t-shirts for the guys who did not win because we made 10,000s or tens of thousands of shirts for the losing team. And we do that for the World Cup. We do that for everything, right? And then we just make a charitable donation for the shirts that we can't sell. If you're a fashion designer, things aren't so good for you either. You come up with some ideas, you work on them, design something, you put it on a runway, you make one of everything, put it on a runway, try and show it off, hope to get some orders for it. Then you send those orders to a factory, you get factory time allocated, it takes months for them to source all the materials, and then to make this stuff and put it on a boat and send it back to Europe. That cycle takes months. And then what happens, <laughs> it's even worse. <laughs> then they go on shelves in stores. And if it's a big hit and you sell out, great, you don't have time to make more. <laughs> if it's not a big hit, then what happens is the store sends it back to you, right? And they get 90 days to pay you. It's not a good deal for fashion designers, unless you're big, really big. Check this out. This is CAD software for designing clothes. It's pretty amazing stuff. I think of it as kind of a new superpower. You can just draw stuff, adjust every little detail about it, make a pattern for a garment that never existed, and boom stick it on a body. Isn't that amazing? We can do a lot with software. This is the old-fashioned way of shipping software. We write some software, put it on a floppy disk, it goes in a box and gets shrink-wrapped, you put it on the shelf and wait for somebody to buy it. And then when they buy it, it comes with, this literally came with a little postcard where you could write bugs on the postcard and mail it back to Microsoft. That's how we used to file bugs. And Microsoft would fix the bug, and on the next version, a year or two later, in a shrink-wrapped box, the bugs would be fixed. Contrast that to how software is made today. I dream something up. I roll out of bed. I write some code. Launch it at lunchtime online. Get some users. They, fi they email me bugs. I fix them, launch a new version at dinner time. That is rapid iteration, right? My, my product development cycle in software went from a year to a few hours. And I'm not kidding about this. Every modern, innovative web app or mobile app you use, this is how it's made. The iteration cycle is hours from my brain to the customer. We would like to be able to do that for everything in the world. So I started a company to play with these ideas. These are my co-founders. Nick is a blindfolded Rubik's Cube champion. <laughs> Marissa is a hot little boss and salsa instructor. And these are the people who I needed to make this happen. So we started a company called Bombsheller to play with these ideas, right? What would it be like if we started from scratch? And if we built the clothing company of the future? And we didn't do anything the old-fashioned way. And we didn't hire anybody from the apparel industry who knows what they're doing. And we just designed it from scratch like a software company. And that was the chance that we had at Bombsheller, and that's exactly what we've done. We started about a year ago. At the beginning of this year, we built a little factory in Seattle next to the Space Needle. Our entire company is in one building, web, marketing, photography, manufacturing. If anything isn't going perfectly, we can change it in 20 minutes. I don't have to call somebody in China and get a change order and get the next version changed for six months down the road. So we make one thing, which is spandex leggings, which are awesome. And they're covered with amazing graphics. And we have a zillion different designs. And these designs come from artists all over the world. Because we don't make anything until you click Buy Now. And then we print your graphics in your size, and we ship them to you. Everything's made on demand. We don't care if we make one of something. 
or a thousand of something. The cost to us is the same. And that's radically different than what's been happening in the apparel industry, right? This is an artist that works with us. His name is John Osgood. And he makes this incredibly intricate paintings by hand. And then he just scans it, puts it on his computer. And the next thing you know, we're making leggings with his art. This is what it looks like. I'll show you what he has to do. It's so easy. You guys can all do this. We have a template in Adobe Illustrator. You just find some art that you made. You drag it on there. This is a map of Seattle from 1890, which I thought was really cool. So you drag it on there, and then you've got leggings designed. That was pretty easy. This is Donna Prima. She's our 3D video game space babe who models stuff for us. Even before we've made it, Donna will show you exactly what it's going to look like. All this technology exists from video games, so we're using it for apparel. There's Marissa again and her six twin sisters showing you that we didn't know if Seattle leggings or Los Angeles leggings or New York, or New York City, Manhattan leggings or Brooklyn leggings would be more popular, so we just made them all. We can make it for Munich. We don't care if there's only one. In fact, we have Buffalo, New York. I don't think anyone even lives there anymore, but we made that design. Fine. Of course, salsa dancers need leggings. It turns out everybody does. Rock climbers need leggings, but they probably like something different than salsa dancers. Roller girls probably want something that you have no interest in, but they need leggings that are different than what people who are into yoga would wear, right? So that's okay. Unlike a normal fashion designer, we're not trying to tell you what we think is cool. We'll make leggings that I don't like, right? We'll make anything because the business model allows that. And what's really important about that is it allows self-expression to come from yourself, right? You can wear what you want, not what you're told by the industry or by what is practical to do in China. So when you place an order, we print your design in your size. This is Kesha, one of our seamstresses. Um, she makes about 100 times as much money as a woman in Bangladesh. <laughs> and that's fine. She'll sew them up, stick them in the mail. So we made some designs for DLD. Uh, there's a few girls around you can see wearing these, which was really fun. We got the designs a few days ago, and now they're real. Oh, so Alex is wearing some, yeah. Oh, I didn't mean to turn you into the spokesmodel. <laughs> I think they look great. Okay. You so we wrote a little bit about this in uh, Design on the current issue. So, um, or uh, the Design reporter did for us. So if you want to know more, you can read that. Um, so I need your help. This is our website. Can you see at the bottom corner it says beta? So I've been coming to DLD for a decade. Steffi's like family to me. Alex, all these girls who've helped me so much over the years. When you make a startup in a new company, you need a lot of help. I need your help. Please spread the word if you know artists who want to make designs. We need them. Send them our way. It's free. Uh, if you know people who want to wear leggings, we could use their help, um, but we're about to launch right now for the first time. So help me count down. Six, fum, fear, dry, zwei, ein. Oh. No more beta. Thank you so much. You can email me or Marissa.